Hello, and welcome to the Homeland Defense and Security Information Analysis Center podcast. My name is Quentin Newcomer, and I'm a technical analyst for HDIAC. HDIAC plays a key role in the Defense Technical Information Center's mission to rapidly, accurately, and reliably deliver the knowledge necessary to develop the next generation of technologies in support of the warfighter and help assure national security. We provide users with focused expert technical consulting and unbiased scientific and technical information through in-depth analysis and specialized information products. Today's podcast will focus on constructing forensic linguistics. Joining me today, we have Drs. Tej and Shobha Bhatia. Dr. Tej Bhatia is a professor of linguistics and director of South Asian languages, as well as the acting director of cognitive sciences at Syracuse University. Tej has been a fellow at the Center for the Study of Popular Television at the S.I. Newhouse School of Public Communication and is a faculty fellow for the Forensic Sciences and National Security Institute. He is a published author on topics of bilingualism and multiculturalism, language and social cognition, media advertising, discourse, sociolinguistics, and the structure of English and South Asian languages. Dr. Bhatia is the editor-in-chief of the Brill Research Perspectives on Multilingualism and Second Language Acquisition, as well as the vice president and president-elect of the International Association for World Englishes. Accompanying Tej is Dr. Shobha Bhatia. She has taught civil and environmental engineering at Syracuse University for over 40 years and is currently a Laura J. and L. Douglas Meredith professor. She has received many prestigious awards, such as being appointed to the National Committee of Geological and Geotechnical Engineering of the National Academy of Science, Engineering, Medicine, and being recognized as a geo-legend at the Geo Institute. She is a co-director of the Woman in Science and Engineering Initiative at Syracuse University. Dr. Bhatia's research efforts focus on the testing, development, design, and innovative use of sustainable natural and polymeric materials for the protection of water quality. Lastly, I want to thank the two of you for joining us today, and I'll be turning things over to you now. Thank you. So uh, today we are going to talk about forensic linguistics. So Tej, could you begin by uh, talking briefly about what forensic linguistics is, and particularly what do forensic linguists do? Forensic linguistics offer a new remarkable frontier in evidence gathering, particularly when no other evidence is available to investigate. This was the case with the Unibomber in early 90s for his successful mailing of baggage bombs. No DNA evidence, informants, eyewitness account, or bomb parts serial number were available to provide clues as to the Unibomber's identity. Even the FBI's often used psychological, criminal, and victimology profiling did not help. Ultimately, linguistic evidence provided a ray of light at the end of the dark tunnel. In spite of the paucity of evidence, forensic cases can be solved using essentially linguistic cues, as in the case of Unibomber and Jihadi Jones. Jihadi Jones is a very interesting case because he was the butcher of Baghdad. He often videotaped 2014 beheadings. In spite of that, although he was fully masked, all you could see were eyes. Forensic linguist could establish his identity and not only identity, even pinpointed the area you know, from where he came from. These cases underscore the distinct and unique power of language as evidence employed in forensic linguistics. Now turning to the second question, what do forensic linguists do? Well, the scope of forensic linguistic work is quite vast. They deal with topics ranging from threat analysis, profiling, deception, and police interviews, confessions, to examine 911 emergency communication and developing and cracking codes. Also other topics such as trademark infringement are handled by forensic linguists, courtroom interpretation, data cleansing, sanitizing data of noise, and so on. These are some other tasks forensic linguists Times. What are the ways in which forensic linguistics add evidence is gathered when solving legal problems such as a political asylum and courtroom translations? Forensic linguist, linguistic evidence is collected in a number of ways. First and foremost, authoritative evidence is provided by law enforcement agencies. 
Another important source of evidence are unwittingly suspect themselves who often have the strong desire or strong psychological urge to self-disclose. This was the case with Uni Warmer, who promised to stop bombing if his manifesto was published. Uni Bomber Ted Kaczynski wrote a lengthy manifesto of 35,000 words entitled Industrial Society and Its Future, which was indeed published by Washington Post in September of 1995. The key Words and phrases used in the manifesto, such as cool-headed logician and the reversal of some social expressions, such as he can eat his cake and have it too, or he can have the cake and eat it too, led to the identification of Uni Bomber by Jim Fitzgerald and with the aid of Ted Kaczynski's brother. They uncovered the forensic linguistic fingerprints of the Uni Bomber's idiosyncratic the third source of evidence comes from family and friend, like again in the case of Unibomber Ted Kaczynski. 178 documents were provided by Kaczynski's family, and these documents serve as a benchmark to compare other documents FBI received with the documents provided by the family. Social media also serves a resource of evidence gathering by monitoring chatter on social networks, forensic linguists can potentially foil terrorist attacks, suicide by, by schizophrenic patients or track sex offenders. With regard to political asylum cases, we collect data by means of structured interviews to gain insights into the linguistic, national, ethnic, and local origins of the asylum speakers. For ethnic and local information, naturally, cultural and anthropology plays a very important role. In addition, forensic linguists use data mining techniques to collect data. Also, they consult corpus, language corpus, and as regards data type, they analyze spoken, written, symbol, drawing, tattoos, emojis, and so on. So, Tej, Cultural study is composed of cultural and sociological analysis. In other words, uh, research into ideology, political, and economic nature of a culture in order to better understand its people and government for national security purposes. Could linguistics play a role in this? Certainly. To better understand people and government for national security purposes, sociolinguistics, social and political bilingualism play a key role. Sociolinguists can uncover deeper biases by using match guys technique. These biases and ideologies contaminate human mind, leading to desperate acts such as terrorism. We cannot underestimate these deeper biases. Based on language change, sociolinguists can read clues to the radicalization of the mind. For example, in research shows that increased use of Arabic by Islamist terrorists points to the radicalization of the mind. The key factor in the kidnapping of Daniel Perp, the World Trade journalist, was accent or the seduction of British accent. Terrorists used British accent to lure Daniel Pearl, and he was convinced by the credibility of the, the terrorist just because of his speech pattern and his prestigious accent. How interesting how the mind works. Can you talk <clears throat> about some conceptual and analytical tools that forensic linguists use for criminal detection and courtroom terrorism or counter-terrorism? Sure. Discovery Channel's laudable thriller Manhunt Unibomber provides a real glimpse into the forensic linguistic concepts, methods, and tools. Built on the strength of powerful conceptual and methodological breakthroughs in linguistics and other related interdisciplinary fields such as cognitive sciences and cultural anthropology, Forensic linguists have developed an art 
and signs of cracking criminal cases based on unconscious dimensions of language used such as Freudian slips and conscious dimension like deception and manipulation. In other words, forensic linguists champion the skill of developing speaker and group profiles based on linguistic traits of individual groups by creating linguistic fingerprints. It is important that these fingerprints be developed based on sound scientific methods that can withstand the scrutiny of codes. Most of the linguistic knowledge, if I have to give the number, 95% of the linguistic knowledge is unconscious and only 5% of the linguistic knowledge is conscious. Suspects can control conscious use of language, but not unconscious use of language. Consider the case of 911 calls, which provides insights into the working of the unconscious and conscious knowledge. Research shows trustworthy and deceptive caller use two dis distinct or different styles. An innocent or trustworthy caller must request for help for the victim immediately, focus on victim's survival, do not accept the death of the victim, cooperate with dispatcher, shows concern for victim, provide facts and information, express urgency, or he or she may even sound rude in their demands. On the other hand, guilty caller states the problem, clearly appears to have already accepted that the victim is dead, show the lack of cooperation with dispatcher, resist answering questions, provide extraneous information, show little or no concern for the victim, do not show any voice modulation, provide conflicting facts with inappropriate order of information, or may even engage in social pleasantries with the dispatcher. Say, hello, how are you? How are you doing? This you cannot find in the case of innocent or trustworthy caller. For example, take the case of Stacy Castor, who killed her two husbands by giving them antifreeze or poison and also framed her daughter into writing a sort of fake suicide note. When in court, she was asked, did you kill your husband? And she said, no. But interestingly, the real answer was given away by her gestural language, which nodded, she, that means admitting her guilt. Tej, this is my last question. Is there ever a disconnect between transcription, translation, and interpretation of language in criminal cases? And if so, what emerging technology and methods are aimed to combat these disconnects? This is a very important question, Shobha. There's a serious disconnect between transcription, translation, and interpretation of eyewitness testimony in US courts. In legal arena, the standard language ideology plays a very important role. Like for example, in the case of Rachel Gentel testimony, Trivon Martin case of 2000 murder. Rachel's non-standard language posed a serious problem of interpretation intelligibility on the part of jury and lawyers. Rachel's testimony was key for prosecution, but it was not taken seriously because of her speech patterns. She was not taken seriously and her testimony was not seen trustworthy. In addition, she received some kind of very hostile responses basically towards her speech pattern. So moving on to the, again, disconnect. A recent article published last year in the Philadelphia Inquirer, whether Philadelphia court reporter accurately transcribed that dialect? The answer was clearly no. The empirical evidence from court documents revealed that roughly 40% of the sentences had something wrong. 67% of attempts at paraphrasing were not accurate and 11% of transcription were simply gibberish. So this shows the disconnect between the actual what is being spoken, what is being said by witnesses, and what is being transcribed. The standards are so low that they are not even acceptable for initial certification for courtroom interpreters or transcriber.
The situation is even bleaker for political asylum cases who speak Guatemalan languages and for witnesses who speak rural varieties of Asian and African languages, let alone say our own ethnic varieties, Afro-American varieties. As regards emerging technology, machine translation type technology of written text such as Google Translate and other Microsoft programs have made impressive advances in translation and transcription of standard variety. Sometimes this type of transcription and translation turn out to be even better than human translator or human transcriptor. Advances in voice technologies such as Siri are also very impressive. However, still there are serious limitations in understanding and interpreting regional dialects. Forensic and sociocultural linguists can help combat the disconnect triggered by the neglect of regional languages. This shows that there is a serious disconnect between what is being spoken by witnesses and actually what appears in official transcripts. Furthermore, the lack of trained interpreter of non-standard and stigmatized speech varieties point to a serious lack of infrastructure of transcribing, translating, and interpreting court cases. Thank you, Tej. Thank you, Shoba, and thank you all. Thank you for joining the HDI Act podcast. To learn more about our services, please reach out directly or visit us online at www.hdiac.org.